Hi, everyone. Uh, we're going to get started with our next chapter, which is chapter seven for hair and fiber evidence. If you look at the note packet, we're only covering sections 7.3 and 7.4, which is specifically hairs and fibers. So you can skip right to that section in the textbook. All right, so I just want to go through some of the notes here so you understand what you're reading and what you're writing down. Uh, when we're talking about hair, the first thing we need to know is just the overall structure and morphology of hair and just to know how it grows. So when we talk about a strand of hair, there's some terms that I know people use interchangeably that might not be correct, so we want to clear that up. Um, hair is an appendage, okay, just like you would, you know, say your arm or your leg. Um, it grows from an organ. In, that's known as the hair follicle. So that's probably the one term that people use incorrectly. The hair follicle is the organ or the pocket in your skin that the hair grows from. Um, the organ stays there, the hair can be shed, you can lose a strand of hair, but then it will regrow another strand of hair. So we just need to realize that the follicle is in the skin, the layer of skin in the epidermis and the hair will grow from it. The length of the hair extends from the root all the way to the tip. So the root of the hair is what grows within that follicle. Okay, we also call that the bulb. And then that extends out the whole middle part of the hair in between one end to the other is called the hair shaft. And then the tip is the very end of your hair. So with the structure of hair, there are three layers that you should know very, very well. Um, we'll be talking a lot about them. The first is the cuticle. Um, that is the outer layer of the hair. So when you see shampoo commercials showing hair damage and they show that picture of a strand of hair under uh, usually like a electron microscope, you see that layering pattern on the outside. That is the cuticle and you can see if it is laying flat against the strand of hair, referring to it being healthy, or if it's damaged, it's cracked, kind of ruffled up looking. Uh, the cuticle behaves just like shingles on a house. So it's a layering pattern that protects the internal structure of the hair, it gives it strength, it gives it stability, keeps out water and moisture and chemicals, um, but it definitely has a unique pattern on the outside. What we'll see uh, in the textbook and a little bit in our notes is that the cuticle patterns are going to differ between human and animal. So humans have a very specific type of cuticle pattern, but animals, depending on where they live and their environments, will have different cuticle patterns. Um, that can do with heat, that could do with um, low temperatures, that can do with water in the environment. So you will see some different cuticle patterns. The cortex is just below the cuticle. So we're going from the outside in. The cortex is where you're going to find the pigment of the hair. Uh, the cortex is where you have a high, high percentage of the protein that makes up hair, which is keratin. Um, and it's basically all of these spindle shaped um, lengths of these proteins that are just bundled together to make the strand of hair. And then right down the middle of the hair, you have what's called the medulla. Now the medulla is something that is useful to determine animal versus human hair. Um, humans don't usually have a medulla though. I would say that if we were to look at everybody's hair in our class, that maybe out of 19 or 20 students, you might only have maybe three or four people that do have a medulla pattern. So it's not something that everybody has. Um, it doesn't mean it's good. It doesn't mean it's bad. It just means it's not there. Um, the, so the medulla is a collection of cells that is organized down the center of the strand of hair. So when we're looking at strands of hair in terms of diversity, uh, we are looking for diversity between human to human and also human to animal. So there's definitely some very specific um, properties that you'll see from human and animal hair that makes them different to each other. 
All right, so now the way that hair grows, if you're looking at the way that your hair grows, um, they say on average, your hair can grow about one centimeter a month. Uh, this could be faster or slower for people. Um, there's also kind of like a timeline attached to each strand of hair in that once hair is ready to be shed, your body will shed it and will grow a new one. So when we look at the hair cycle, the growth cycle for a strand of hair, we have antigen, catagen, and telogen. Um, and you can remember that because they are in alphabetical order, ACT. So antigen, active growth. Okay, this is where the root of the hair is firmly in the follicle. The follicle is providing nutrients to the hair through what we call the dermal papilla, uh, which is where those blood vessels attach to the very, very bottom of that follicle. And it will pass on all the nutrients to the strand of hair to grow. Then when you get to the catagen phase, this is considered a transition phase because this is where the growth is stopping and the hair is basically sitting there. Um, you can see that the shape of the bulb changes dramatically. Um, and now the follicle does not have that strong hold on the bulb anymore. So this occurs over the course of a week or two. Then when we get to the telogen phase, this is considered a resting phase. Um, basically, you see that hair being pushed towards the surface. It's still in the follicle, but it's being pushed towards the surface. So at this point, we are beginning to um, prepare for the hair to be shed. And then you can see with the last phase, we return back to the antigen phase and you have a new uh, strand of hair being formed, which they refer to the hair matrix forming. So that protein is starting to collect again. The dermal papilla will attach itself to the base of that follicle, and we will go back to that antigen phase again. Uh, the one thing I didn't mention is that that antigen phase, that growing phase, could be three to six years. So you can see that's a pretty good um, length of time, but it's also a pretty good range of time. So again, some people will grow a strand of hair for a longer period of time. Some people, um, their bodies are in a way programmed to shed their hair a bit sooner. Okay, so those are your three uh, growing stages. Now what's important with forensics is if you have a hair that has been forcibly removed, you're gonna hear that term um, in your textbook. If a hair is forcibly removed due to a struggle, um, that means that the hair was ripped from the follicle before it was ready to be shed. When that happens, this is where you get the skin cells attached to that root, and this is where you can do a DNA analysis from a strand of hair. Um, we'll talk about the DNA within the strand of hair, um, but in terms of regular nuclear DNA, you're only going to get that if you have what's called the follicular tag, which are cells from the follicle attaching itself to the root. Within the hair, you can only get mitochondrial DNA within that strand. Okay, and this is uh, a very detailed picture, uh, basically showing skin. This is your scalp. So you can see this is a hair emerging from the scalp. You can see another strand of hair on the right-hand side that has been growing a little bit more. Uh, but again, that you have that approximate one centimeter per month is the growth of hair. Sometimes they say half an inch, very similar. Okay, here we can see some cuticle patterns. Um, so we're looking at these and these all, the, this picture on the right-hand side is probably the clearest picture. This is very, very indicative of human hair. Um, we call that an imbricate pattern, which is a very flat and wide, you know, shingle-like pattern. Uh, you're also going to get some cuticle patterns that are very triangular shape um, that give more of a, you know, a rigidness or a stiffness to the hair. But when you look at the cuticle, this is what you're seeing. Um, this picture in the upper left, if we were to have you observe your own hair with our compound microscopes in class, you might be able to see this. Um, depending on the lighting, that's gonna be the most important thing. We don't wanna flood the hair with too much light, but you might be able to get a good uh, image of the cuticle of your hair. 
Okay, so again, the, uh, the diversity between hair, what are we looking at? Um, human versus animal, and I also mentioned human versus human. Those are the two things that we're looking at. So what are we going to be comparing? Well, if it's human versus animal, the scale or cuticle structure, uh, the medulla pattern and the uh, medullary index, which we'll get to in just a little bit. The color, the length of the hair, if you have a full strand, uh, and also the diameter. So we learned about the diameter calculations during microscopes. We're gonna be using that again. Um, color intensity of the pigment. You can also determine if hair has been chemically treated. Uh, and you'll also be able to see ethnic backgrounds. Um, you can see, you know, possibly the ethnicity of a person based on the pigment distribution uh, in your hair. Okay, so the medulla patterns. We're going to look specifically at these patterns now and how to differentiate one species from another. And also, we'll look at the medullary index. So human hair, uh, we would normally have no medulla, which we refer to as absent. So whenever you're asked about a medulla pattern, if there is not, no medulla there, if it's not present, you would say that it is an absent medulla pattern. That is the terminology you want to use. Um, other medulla patterns, we're going to talk about continuous, fragmented, and interrupted. Human hair will normally have fragmented medulla patterns if there is a medulla. And the medullary index we'll get to is approximately one third or less, which means the medulla occupies one third or less of the hair's diameter. Okay, so you're seeing what fraction of the hair of the hair's diameter is occupied by that medulla. Animal hair, we have many different types of medullas. Um, and only when there is a medulla present can you determine a medullary index. So we first have what's called the solid medulla patterns. Uh, these are the ones that you'll normally see in humans. Uh, there are some animals that could have these as well. So we have continuous, which is just a solid straight line. You have interrupted, which is looks like that continuous, but with a couple little cuts in between, a couple little breaks. Um, and fragmented is just a very random pattern, basically just a lot of little pieces. So if you take a look, um, you have the human hair. Uh, with a medulla on the left hand side here. We don't really see any solid lines. This would be a bit more fragmented because we just see this random little pattern. Uh, we have an interrupted um, type of pattern here. Uh, let's see. So if we have on the left hand side, since we do have those little pieces, that would be, I'm sorry, not interrupted. That is a fragmented medulla. Right in the center, we have the absent medulla. You can see all you have is the hair strand no darkened line in the middle. And then on the right-hand side, we have our continuous, uh, since it is a solid line there. All right, so you can see those patterns. Um, this is definitely more fragmented than this one. Um, if you're looking at fragmented versus interrupted, interrupted normally is gonna, is gonna have that cut pattern, that broken pattern, but more at even intervals. Um, so that just gives you an idea of that difference between fragmented and interrupted. Now for the animals, this is where it gets a little more interesting. Um, with cats and rabbits, we have what's called a uniserial pattern. And a uniserial pattern is when you have um, like a box shape, all right? You have this boxed shape pattern that stacks upon itself. Um, and uni, meaning one, is just one row. So you can have multi-serial, which would be multiple boxes. So rows and rows of those boxes. Um, cow and dog, we have a bit of a fragmented pattern. The dog is difficult to see because of the high pigment. Um, the cow, we see that fragment pattern. We also have a pattern called vacuolated. Um, vacuolated, I always feel like it looks like bubbles. Um, you have just basically, it looks like these, these globular shapes that are just randomly arranged 
through the middle. Um, so we see goat and guinea pig here. The guinea pig, this has been, this is looked under a fluorescent microscope. So the guinea pig does not have glowing yellow hair. Um, it's just the way that it was chemically treated and viewed with the fluorescent microscope. A deer has something called a lattice pattern. Now the lattice pattern takes up the entire width of that strand of hair and it looks like a snake skin. So this is a very easy medulla pattern to spot because it's the only one that has all of these tiny little circles that go side to side. So now once you have a medulla, you can figure out the medullary index. The medullary index is, again, the fraction of the hair's diameter that's occupied by the medulla. So you would mark off the width of the medulla and then count the number of times it fits across the width of the hair. So if you think back to the microscope where you calculate a diameter, you counted how many times that specimen fit across the diameter of the field of view. Now we're just counting along the diameter of the hair. So I marked off the medulla approximately. This is not a clear or sharp picture. So this is approximate. I marked off the medulla here approximately this width. And then I took that width on a piece of paper and I marked it one, two, three times. So we would say that the medullary index for this strand of hair is approximately one third. So if we were to take this image here, this is a fragmented medulla pattern. I marked off the width and now I'm going to start to mark off how many times it fits across the hair. So we have one time, two, three, four, five, six, again, approximately. So we would say that the medullary index for this particular strand of hair is one sixth. So however many times it fits across, that's your, uh, your denominator, and just put one over that number and you're all set. Okay, questions concerning hair examination. What can you figure out? Uh, number one, can you figure out the area on the body that the hair originated from? Um, you could, you could get a good idea. Is it definitive? Maybe not, depends on the strand of hair, but you might be able to narrow it down. Um, if you're talking about hair from the scalp, you have very little uh, variation in the diameter. Um, basically all the hairs are very, very similar to each other. Uh, pubic hair with uh, sexual assault cases. Um, you will have lots of variation in shape, in um, straightness versus curliness, the variation in the diameter. Um, and it usually does have a continuous medulla. So this is where you would normally find a medulla. Uh, beard hair. Uh, with beard hair, if you have someone who shaves on a regular basis, um, you could see the cut or shaving markings at the ends, um, depending on how the hair was cut. The cross section doesn't tend to be circular. It's more of a triangle shape, and it normally tends to be cut uh, very coarse. Also with beard hair, you could have a double medulla that's been found to be very common. Can the racial origin be determined? Um, many cases, yes. Uh, if you go back to, um, you know, archaeological and anthro um, different studies with uh, anthropology, um, you can see the different backgrounds. So you have mongoloid hair, which is more of an Asian descent, um, very, very dark pigment color, uh, Caucasian, much lighter pigment distribution. And those from African descent, the Negroid uh, descent, you have this very uneven um, pigment distribution, which is very unique to everything else. So there is a, a similarity with the pigment patterns between the strands of hair and the ethnic backgrounds. Um, also the cross section. All right, so on the left you have Asian, which is very circular. Um, Caucasian and African hair does tend to be a bit more oval shape. Um, and again, you could see that pigment, lots of pigment with Asian and African hair um, as opposed to Caucasian hair. So this is something that could help form a match if you're looking for that. 
Um, age, that should say age or sex, gender, my apologies. Um, it, no, it's difficult. Um, age really can only be determined if you're dealing with an infant because the hair is so much finer. Um, so when you're dealing with just a strand of hair that you're looking at a microscope, you can't just tell the age. Um, the only way you can tell gender is if you have DNA for um, a DNA analysis. Uh, forcibly removed hair. If you have that follicular tag again, the skin attached to that root, Yes, that can determine if it was forcibly removed. The only way that you can uh, individualize human hairs with DNA, if you don't have D nuclear DNA from the follicular tag, you will go with mitochondrial DNA, which is found in the hair shaft. Okay, so again, the root is extremely important in terms of that DNA, if you're able to find that. This gives you a microscopic image of that those skin cells attached to the root again this hair has been is being viewed under um, a fluorescent microscope so that's why it has that blue color to it um, if you have the tissue attached um, again you see those this is under regular compound microscope um, every now and then hair could be forcibly removed and stretched and snapped so you can get a distorted shape to the part of the hair that was actually stretched and snapped. These are the different cuts, all right? On the right-hand side here, you have what's called a blunt cut because it was cut across the diameter. Um, this would be more of that angular cut. And then at the bottom here, this shows the distinct line of hair that was dyed. Um, so you can see that you know, difference in the color very, very clearly. A couple of images with hair that has been um, split, okay, you refer to it as a split end. So when hair gets damaged and that cuticle breaks, you can see here all of these strands that are coming out. This is the um, keratin, these are the proteins that are found in the hair in that cortex level. So you can see all of them coming out. It's kind of like bundled spaghetti. Um, and when you, you know, break the integrity of that cuticle and the hair does break open, um, that's when the damage occurs. So on the left-hand side, you see it under this electron microscope. On the right-hand side, that's a regular split end under a compound microscope. Um, and up here, you just see debris um, or dirt, or it could be styling products on the strand of hair. And then as evidence, um, when you are dealing with someone who you believe is a suspect you, and you need a hair sample, you will collect hair. Um, there is a particular number, a minimum number of hair that has to be collected. Um, normally they go with about 50 head hairs from all areas of the scalp. And if you're dealing, for, uh, dealing with a sexual assault case, they will also collect uh, pubic hairs from the, uh, from the suspect. Okay, and that is the end of section 7.3 for the PowerPoint. Again, make sure you're using the textbook um, so that way you can fill in the rest of the notes and uh, we will return back with section 7.4 with fibers. All right, take care guys.